Hi, this is Jeff Ventry from Blackfish Movie. I'm here with Jim Waddell, who was in Damnation Film. Jim is retired from the Army Corps of Engineers, and he is the nation's foremost expert on the four lower Snake River dams. He's studied them extensively, and yesterday we met with community leaders and influencers at Jenica's Coffee Shop in Ellensburg, Washington. Jim, I, I want you to make the case for why eastern Washington ranchers and, and farmers get a good deal if we take down those lower four Snake River dams. For sure. Um, you know, originally these dams were built because of the promise of the Inland Empire that would come from barging uh, grain down the river and things up to Lewiston, Idaho and so forth like that. That Inland Empire never materialized and so instead what you have a 140 mile you know set of reservoirs on top of this once great valley that was full of vineyards and orchards and little farms and villages and so forth. And so for starters what you get is you get that back. You know 20,000 acres you know you could put five or six thousand that back into uh, you know vineyards and so forth and still have an incredibly rich um, riparian area that you didn't have before you know when, with uh, the farming that was going on. And so you get not only you get all the salmon back that the, uh, were so important to tribes and the people that lived there at the time, you get this reconnection to place and you get um, you know, a couple thousand jobs, well actually 5,000 jobs in the six county area along that river there. And, you, and that translates to about 500 or 600 million dollars a year in direct expenditures that pour into that area. So that's just a, you know, a sampling of what you get for eastern Washington there. How are farmers on the east side, especially ones that are running wind turbines, losing out on their subsidies from the government by having these dams uh, you know, spilling water in the spring? Well, actually, those wind turbines aren't a subsidy, um, is, is like most people think. A lot of those are funded by the private sector and so forth. And, <clears throat> but what happens is there's so much hydropower, especially in the springtime, that Bonneville Power just has to run these turbines in order to, you know, well, to generate power, but they don't need it. It's surplus. And so at times there's our, there are, there are cur curtailments on wind energy, and that means the wind turbines are shut down. That means those farmers that have those turbines are losing money because of the excess hydropower. And you know, a lot of those farmers really depend on those turbines to keep their farms. That's the only thing between make or break you know, farming out here. It's just because the margins are so slim. Explain to me um, how Bonneville Power has to cook the books to make the economics work out. Well, the problem is when you add it all up, um, the amount of money that it takes to operate these dams is, 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 is exceeding the revenues they get off these four dams. And so what they do is they defer debt payments and stuff like that, but ultimately all that pay comes back to the ratepayer. And so right now there's a massive interest payment that Bonneville has to make of like $43 million or $44 million a year just on those four dams. And so when you add it all up, the, um, you know, the, the revenues just do not exceed the, uh, the amount of money that it takes to operate those dams. But they're pretty good at moving the, you know, uh, you know, leaving stuff off the account. If the Corps of Engineers pay something, they don't show that, even though later on it gets picked up as debt or something like that. I'm a physiatrist, mean, meaning I'm a medical doctor that works with uh, amputees, vets who have had their limbs blown off and, and so forth. And one of my colleagues, Kaya Bush, is a prosthetist, which means she builds uh, legs for, for, for vets and so forth. But she's an avid fisherwoman. How would taking down the four lower snake dams impact the fish returns on the Yakima River, which is where she fishes? Well, what we have to keep in mind is the Columbia Snake is a system of rivers that all have salmon in them. But this, the Snake River is the, the backbone of the system, particularly today because the, the Columbia has been mostly cut off. And so when you lose Snake River runs, that means the other runs in the Columbia are getting hit harder out in the ocean by predators of all kinds, and it's not just marine mammals. They get, um, and they get fished harder from commercial fishing and sport fishing and stuff like that. And so what it does, it just makes the pie smaller and so the you know, Yakima run is getting hit harder in terms of you know, the number of fish that can make it back and, and, and spawn and so forth. So um, that's the problem. We just get the numbers get smaller and smaller and smaller and that means the competition is greater on these Yakima runs. What would you say? Tell, talk about the uh, the mortality that each dam causes. It's a pretty easy mathematical formula, as far as you explained to myself and Mark Brown yesterday. Well, it's it's, um, it's pretty well now documented that um, you know about 
three or four percent of a, of, of a run juveniles die going over each dam. And so there's four of them, so you do the math there and you come up with, you know, 10, 11 percent. But what's also going on That's is... That's per each, dam, right? Uh, well, each dam is about a three or four percent mortality going over the dam. Okay. But you also have a mortality in the reservoir. Gotcha. which is another 6 or percent or 7 percent so it's about 10 percent per dam and so by the time you get to the Columbia River across those four dams you, you've probably got a mortality of around high 30s or 40 percent before you even get there and then of course you've got mortality on the Columbia River dams of a similar so by the time they get to the ocean you have wiped out 80 something percent 90 percent of the, the juveniles that started off at the top of the system on the dams and so that's the problem you just there's too much mortality. And so eliminating the four snake dams eliminates about 40 to 50 percent of the mortality right there. Why is breaching these four dams or dewatering these four dams uh, faster and, and more effective than more hatchery fish? Well, of course, uh, the wild natural fish are the ones that are the most um, endurable, resilient uh, fish. So when they go out in the ocean, they can they survive better and stuff like that. Hatchery fish. Um, because of their domesticated nature, basically have genes that are basically winding down in terms of their viability because they're inbred. And so what's happening is these hatchery fish get over into and, and, and breed with the wild fish and it works, the, it dilutes the genetic diversity of the wild fish too. And you also have to keep in mind as the numbers get lower and lower on these wild fish, they're, they're interbreeding with each other, and so their gene pool gets less and less and less. And so ultimately what you have, and that's the crucial situation, that's why breaching is so urgent now this year, is because the gene pool has worked itself down so low that it's almost, we're almost at the point where we can't recover these runs any longer. There's a famous poster that was, um, a billboard that was uh, erected in Portland, Oregon by Trouts Unlimited back in 1999 that, that stated that by about 2017, we would lose the spring Chinook runs on the Snake River. Has that projection been accurate? Yeah, it's, it's, it's really amazing how we knew this, scientists knew this back, you know, 18, 19, 20 years ago and made that prediction. And here we are in 2018 and we're basically got to, we got to breach an hour, so it's, it's all over. Um, and, and even, and what's really <laughs> obvious about this is the National Marine Fisheries, NOAA, published a report. Um, it's their recovery plan for spring and summer Chinook uh, in 2017 and a draft in 26. And in both cases, what that plan says is that they, they got all these actions going on in the, in the basin to recover spring and summer Chinook. However, none of these actions are going to recover spring and summer Chinook. So you've got to ask yourself, well, what kind of recovery plan is that? But there it is, black and white, for everybody to see. They're saying you cannot recover these spring and summer Chinook. Uh, and the reason is because of genes and the overall numbers. None of this other stuff's going to work. And the only thing, that, of course, they don't mention is what will work. And what will work is dam breaching. So you've got the 2002 EIS in your lap right there. What were the four options that were laid out back in 2002? And, and why is this still operational? And, t and briefly touch on how you know, maybe a lot of these NGOs just want to do another study, I guess. Well, sure. This, this is the operational EIS for these four dams, and, and you have to have an EIS. And so this is the core, what they're currently using. But what was in this study back in the late 90s that culminated in this 2002 study was the fact that they looked at different alternatives for improving salmon runs. And, and the first one was just do nothing, which, you know, just leave the dams alone. They've done a lot of work already. Just let it go. The second alternative was transporting more fish, and they've been doing that for years, and it was kind of like mixed results. Nobody really understood how effective that was, but it was in there as an alternative. The third was to hang more expensive hardware on the dams to let the juveniles get over, bypass they call it. And um, that was a pretty expensive proposition at the time, but what it's turned into is very, a lot more expensive. And the fourth alternative was dam breaching. But what the Corps did is they ignored what this EIS said, is they, they ignored the fact that dam breaching was the best alternative for recovering. They also ignored the fact that it, this report says that doing um, alternative two transport or hanging more hardware, number three, is actually not as good as just lit doing nothing. So they did something worse than doing nothing. We spent a billion dollars hanging hardware and transporting fish in the last 15 years on those dams, and we got absolutely nothing for it. And so what's incredible about this document is here it is, it's, it's, it, the Corps uses it today, it has breaching in it, 
And so all you have to do, all the Corps of Engineers has to do is say, look, we're going to exercise Alternative 4, we're going to breach the dams, and it's already covered in this EIS. And the Secretary of the Army has confirmed that. Uh, a year ago they said, yes, this is the EIS, and yes, it has dam breaching in it. How many presidents have you advised? Uh, I know you've spent a lot of time in the White House, for example. Uh, we were talking about uh, the Clinton administration, but I know you've worked for the, the Bush administration and, and spent lived in D.C., worked in D.C., how does it shift the game, you know, and you had President Obama's attention before his term was up, and now we've got President Trump in there. How does that change the game, or does it change the game at all? Well, sure. Every time we have a change in presidential or administration, you gotta, you got to look at what their, what their passions are, what they're about, and what their agenda is. And, you know, with Obama, it was, you know, he was, you know, more environmentally tuned, so we were, you know, talking about salmon and we were talking about orcas and, and you know the thing is he was willing to breach these dams but he never heard from the Northwest delegation. No elected official out here um, contacted Obama and said yes go ahead with breaching we, you know, we support that. Well now we got a different president. Um, this guy's all about making America great, modernizing infrastructure, um, you know, uh, getting more jobs and stuff like that and that's exactly that is the big thing about breaching these four dams, is the number of jobs you bring back, four or five thousand, the amount of tax money you save, um, the modernization of infrastructure is crucial here. These four dams are losers, they waste money. We've got other dams that need money, and so it's a simple, you know, modernization idea. It's okay, we'll get rid of these, you know, these poor performing assets, take that money, put it on the other assets that are better performing assets, but are short of money. So that clearly fits in with the kind of um, uh, agenda that this president has. You mentioned, we talked yesterday about run of the river dams and how these four snake dams are not used for flood control, but flood control is often one of the justifications for keeping them. Can you explain to everybody that these dams do not work for flood control and why that is? Well, sure. These, um, these dams were basically built for navigation. That means getting barges up to Lewiston, Idaho, and they were built for hydropower. So in both cases, for that to be possible, they have to keep the reservoirs full of water all the way to the top in order to let the barges get all the way up to the top to Lewiston. And by the same token, the hydropower needs a lot ahead, and you can't keep fluctuating the dams and still get hydropower out in an inefficient way. The third thing is, is that um, the fish ladders that require that the adults come up, they depend on having water at pretty much the same elevation. So you're stuck with this flat, long lake on each dam. And what that means is, is that any water, the amount of water coming down has to go out at the same time. So it's a constant flow of the same amount of water. There, there's no storage capacity. A flood control dams works by lowering the reservoir in the winter time. So when the spring floods come down, it fills up and you can let the water out as you um, is see as you as it makes sense. So back in 2014 you kind of came into my world by the movie Damnation which everyone should watch and then you came to the Super Pod event and I noticed you're drinking out of a I Love Blackfish mug that I strategically gave you. <laughs> how does how does the uh, the uh, and, and you spoke you've spoken at two Super Pod events and I hope you'll come back to Super Pod 6 and talk about the Orca Salmon Connection. Well, it's, um, it's, it's now very clear, and has been for you know, quite a few years, that um, the southern resident killer whales, um, a unique species that are endangered, um, depend on Chinook. That's their primary source of food, 80% of what they eat is Chinook, and about half of what they eat comes out of the Columbia snake system. And so, um, so <laughs> unfortunately for them, when the snake runs start collapsing and the, to the degree that they are now, those uh, orcas are starving or they're malnourished and so forth and so um, it's uh, it's a matter of where the food you know having food and that's critical for them so that's that's the main connection it's the it's the Chinook they must eat and where they come from the Snake River. Now you're retired from the Army Corps <clears throat> where I think you spent like 35 years but you're kinda like uh, leading the leading the charge on this and you're almost like a one-man show with some with a lot of volunteers helping you including myself so I've had the opportunity with you to go to the state capitol here in Washington and meet JT and Governor Inslee's staff and some of their experts or whatever. And then we, we've also had phone calls with Gabriella Calperthwaite on the line and spoke to uh, Inslee's staff in a conference call. I got the impression that the governor's staff is not really well up to speed on these issues. Can you? Is that true? Well, they should be. We've given them... 
hundreds of pages of information from these government documents. We showed them the CAIS and said, look, we got it in here, all the facts are here. And what's not happening is, is the governor in this case, Governor Inslee, is not getting that information. And I got that from talking to him briefly at a fundraiser a few months ago, is that he really didn't understand some of the most basic things about this. For instance, he thought that Congress had to authorize the breaching of the dam. So that's not true. The Corps has that authority already. Um, he thought that we would need congressional appropriations. No, we don't. Bonneville Power, by, by definition, by law, has to pay for 92% of what goes on at these dams, including breaching. He also thought that the best thing for orcas was to do more studies and look at different alternatives like more hatcheries and keeping vessels away from orcas as a means of recovering them in this emergency situation that he's admitted is going on. That won't work. And I had to tell him that. And the, and the main thing, the most important thing I told him was that you have to breach these dams in order to save these orcas. And he had not heard that. I mean, he just simply couldn't fathom that that was what he was hearing from me. So you and I also, in, in addition to meeting with the Governor Inslee's staff, we went and, and we attended these couple Free the Snake events. Um, and we both spoke at the, I don't know if it was the last one or two years ago, but um, uh, how are the NGOs kind of somehow impeding or stretching this thing along a little bit? It doesn't seem like they're getting the job done, but they seem to be fundraising a lot on this issue. Well, sure. There's been a set handful of NGOs, quite a few actually, that have been engaged with dam breaching for 20, 25 years. And they started off, you know, on the right foot, you know, said, okay, we'll sue the federal government. And what's happened, though, after 20 or so years of litigation, and they've won five times in the court, which is basically a process victory, because all the court said was, we want a new document. Give us a new plan for the biological opinion. And so... That has happened again about two years ago, and the, and the judge says, you know, we'll, we'll study this thing some more. Give me a new EIS. Why do we need a new EIS when we got one right here that says damn breaching, you know, it's got damn breaching in it. And so that is their game plan. And so it, it, it's, they're just caught up in this endless cycle of litigation process. They, they talk about damn breaching, but the way they're going, this litigation is up a box canyon. There's no way out. And so that's why we, this group of volunteers and so forth, is focused on the processes, I mean the, the policies that allow dam breaching to take place immediately, I mean within a matter of a few months. And those policies, you know, are there, the core can use them, there's a, there's a way out of this thing, and it doesn't require the course at all. And, and one of the ideas is that the core and environmentalists and all this kind of stuff believe is that only the judge can tell the core to breach the dams. But that's not true. The Corps can breach these dams right now. They don't have to wait on the judge to tell them something to do in five years from now. They can go ahead and do it now. So tell me real quick, because a lot of people uh, have seen Elwha, and by the way, the Elwha story is heartwarming. Anyone that doesn't know about the, the fish returns and the environmental impact taking that, those two dams on the Elwha River at, has had, just can Google that. But talk about how breaching the four snake dams is way easier than what they did at Elwha. Well, sure. Well, um, the big thing with um, the Elwha dams is that uh, you had to, the, the lower dam you had to completely remove to get passage of the river through there. Um, and the upper dam was a concrete 200 foot high structure that they had to chisel a big notch in. That was hard work. The Snake River dams, each one of them has an earthen portion or earthen berm. And it's a very simple matter to simply notch that with some bulldozers down to about halfway down the, you know, it'll lower the reservoir while you're notching. And then you just basically let the water flow through the, the notch and, and it basically erodes the rest of the earthen berm away, the dam. And so what you're left with is a river running around the concrete structure. So all that concrete, the spillways, the turbines, and all that kind of stuff just sits there. And the river runs around it. And that's why it's so simple. And it's, not, it's, 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 it's actually cheaper to breach those four dams on the Snake River than it was the Elwha dams. Well, the three states that are key players in this are Washington, number one, and then Idaho and Oregon. So Oregonians, Idahoans, and, and Washingtonians need to to help us with this. What can they? What can people like influencers like Mark Brown and other people that we met yesterday do to take action? Well, I think we we, we have to realize is the Corps of Engineers. Yes, they have the, they can make this decision, but they are not going to make it unless they hear from the senior elected officials in the state of Washington or Oregon or Idaho. And in the case of Washington, that's Governor Inslee and Senator Murray. And so what people in Washington have to do is somehow get the word up to them 
and they can, you know, whoever they're comfortable with, you know, talk to your county commissioner, your mayor, or your PUD commissioner and talk about why are we wasting so much money on these dams and it's costing our rates to go up. So whatever elected official that you are comfortable talking to, go talk to them. Tell them that you want Governor Inslee to contact the Corps and breach the dams. Uh, yesterday uh, we talked about the insolvency of EPA essentially uh, as the cost of these dams continues to rise to operate them. Uh, can you explain to us taxpayers about 15 cents on the dollar? Well sure, when the Corps did the, the economic analysis back um, in 2000, they had to do uh, an economic comparison. And what that meant over the life of the project, how much money does it take to put into these dams and what's your economic benefit. And they didn't do a very good job in this report, and so we've hired economists to go redo this, look at their numbers, use their data, and, and correct those benefit cost tables. And what we find is when you use the, the, the procedures the Corps dictates properly, what your benefit is, is 15 cents on the dollar. And so that means for every dollar the taxpayers and the ratepayers put into these, dollar, these dams, they're only getting 15 cents back. Whereas compared to breaching, you get four, at least $4 back for every dollar invested. And that's because the number of jobs that you get from recreation and fishing and, and agriculture, vineyards and so forth. And so breaching is a far more beneficial thing from an economic standpoint than keeping the dams. So this is a political issue, and unfortunately, what we need to see is uh, that this is a win-win scenario for both the left and the right. And so uh, the GOP tends to be a little bit more dug in on the pro-dam issue, and the Democrats don't seem to want to run with the issue because it's a p political hot potato. But how can we convey to people that this is a win-win for everybody? Well, you know, it's interesting. That's what everybody says, oh, it's a political thing, it's too hot to handle, but you know, you think about it, like you said, it's really a benefit to both parties. And I think what, what we discovered when we did the public review process back in 2000 was that, you know, we had 240,000 people comment on this, on this decision. In other words, do you want to keep the dams or breach the dams? And what we found was, and this hasn't really been reported, is that a large majority of folks wanted these dams breached. And so out there are these silent majority of people that want these dams breached, and they come from all sectors. They're farmers, they're, they're urbanites, they're fishermen, they're tribal people, and all this kind of stuff. And so they, there is an overwhelming number of people that want the dams breached. So it, it's really kind of an interesting that we keep calling it a political problem. Really, it's just one that we don't understand. We won't take the time to listen to the facts. We won't take the time to look at what the public was telling us in 2000. And that's the problem. So you mentioned uh, learning the facts being the key thing, and you seem to be like one of the only people out there putting out solid information. Talk about the misinformation that's out there, and how whether it's the government or whoever pits different parties against each other to kind of kick the can down the street. Well, sure. There's some lobbyist groups that have been around for a long time on this issue. They got the dams built in the first place, and it morphed into organizations like Northwest River Partners and stuff like that. And, and it's their job. They get paid to basically defend this, th these dams. And so they will take any fact and twist it around. Like one of their favorite ones is to say, oh, the dams have a 97% of survival rate. Well, what they mislead is that they, what they're saying is make one dam, just the dam, has 97% survival. But what they don't tell you is the reservoir kills another 6 or 7%. And what they also don't tell you that's per dam, so you've got to multiply that down each one. But when they write it, people think, oh, there's only 3% of the salmon that don't make it. That's not true. Almost 80 or 90% of the salmon don't make it to the ocean because of all the dams. That's a, just a typical example. Now, you have retired uh, somewhere. You're, you're working hard, but you live over in Port Angeles, right on, the, right on the water. Can you talk briefly about the differences between the salmon numbers now, where you live, and, and what they were when you first moved over there? Well, sure. I mean, you know, I'm like everybody else. I, I moved out there because I thought, you know, I could enjoy nature and fish salmon right out in my front yard and stuff forth and from a kayak, and that was possible for a while, you know, 10 years ago. But now the runs have diminished, and, and, and the relationship, though, is that people tend to forget that this is one big, huge e ecosystem all the way from Alaska up to the headwaters in Idaho. And so if you take out the main body of fish that represents the backbone of that ecosystem, that affects 
salmon runs all along the Columbia, up the coast, and in the Salish Sea, and up to Alaska. And, and what I mean by that is without that big backbone chunk of salmon or sh and Chinook that come out of the snake, that means all these other runs like the Elwha, which is now not recovering like it initially did, they're getting hit harder from commercial fishing and other predation from uh, birds, animals, and so forth like that. And so it, the whole system is being constrained and taken down by the loss of the most important run, the Snake River runs. I'm going to put you on the spot here because we've got about three minutes of memory card left. Number one, I'm inviting you to present again at Superpod 6, which is July 17, 18, and 19 in, uh, the, uh, in Friday Harbor. So I want you to do that. Number two, can you tell people about your website? Sure. We um, set up a website some years ago called damnsense.org, and we're not an organization. All it is is a website, but on this website are all these documents that we have prepared, letters we've written, videos that we've made, and so forth. And, and basically what that is is showing that these government documents, we don't make this stuff up, we don't go out and generate our own numbers, we look at government documents, synthesize them into summary reports and different reports, get them corrected, and all that information is on damnsense.org. And we put it there so the public can see it, the government folks can see it, and, and it's basically how we, it's one of the means we have of educating folks. So just real quickly, um, you also, I, I believe there's a Twitter handle called Damn Sense where John operates and... Uh, yeah, we, we have a Twitter account. I'm not a Twitter guy, so, uh, <laughs> you know, and, uh, so I don't know how that works, but yes, there is a Twitter account up there it, and you can see it on damn sense it's right at the bottom of the um, home page so people can find these documents they can follow damn sense on social media and I never got the answer whether you can present for me at superpod 6 <laughs> <laughs> yes I can present for you all right thanks thanks Jim you bet.